Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural Story Time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only oh, 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 in the in dark. dark. Southern Hauntings Uncle I.H. decided to build a house for his nephew. The plans were drawn and soon some itinerant carpenters and painters came along to help in the construction and painting of the house. The nephew, Mr. S., lived in a log cabin just back of the construction site. An agreement was reached whereby the itinerant workers could sleep in the new building and board with the S. family. Mr. S., his wife, and small daughter lived in the cabin. One day, as the house neared completion, one of the carpenters walked in and told Mr. S., that he was leaving the job because someone had put a hex on the place and he could not sleep at night for all the noise going on in the new house. The doors opened and closed all night. There was a tapping sound in the walls. Strange things were happening in the hallway. Mr. S. assured him that in all probability, some of the neighborhood boys were tic-tacking the house. He would therefore clean up the debris that very day and would in all probability solve the mystery. True to his promise, he cleaned the house and surrounding premises that day, but he failed to find the tic-tacking evidence. Mr. S. decided that he and his wife and child could move in the new structure and all this foolishness would stop. Unfortunately, this did not give the carpenter peace of mind, nor did it help the S. family. At night, they would see a casket roll up to the side of their bed, they would light a lamp and there would be nothing there. As they would try to settle down again, their bed would rise from the floor. The house moaned and creaked all night long. The wagon belonging to the little girl raced up and down the center hallway. The doors opened and closed all night. Mr. S. watched the workmen closely and came to the conclusion that the painter was the offending person with devilish powers. He confronted him with this information. And the painter acknowledged that he was possessed with powers from the devil, and every night before he went to sleep, he released these evil spirits to do their work. One day, Mr. S. had to go to town, and Mrs. S. prepared dinner as was her custom and called the workmen in to eat. The painter in question asked her how she would like to see her kitchen table start walking. She was frightened, but rather sternly replied that if he wanted to keep eating there, he had better leave his tricks away from the kitchen. The house was eventually completed, and as the painter took his departure, he was warned that he had better take his evil spirits away with him. He departed, but it was noted that doors in the house closed and latched. They might be, without warning, would come open and be standing ajar. This house was eventually partially burned, and in its place a new house was constructed. The only part of the old building put in the new was the front door. The new front door could be latched, firmly closed, but with no warning would come open. Mrs. B and her family all believe this is the ghost of the devil-possessed painter still doing his work. Another story. Well, anyway, that first summer... We were there, we would all be out in the field working, and Mama would be there at the house, and her first grandchild, Leontine, would be there with her, and Mama said the first time she noticed anything she thought she heard, a bunch of people coming up out front talking, and she wondered who could that be, because she knew it wasn't time for us to come from the field for dinner, and she went out, looked everywhere, and didn't see a soul. Well, that's the first thing she told us when we came to the house for dinner. That she heard noises and she thought it was somebody coming out front. Well, she didn't see anything. So it went like that and one Saturday night, Louis and Beula came to stay all night with us. And that left Mildred and me to sleep upstairs. And after the lights were out, well, we were lying there in bed and all of a sudden my cover began to move off of me. And I told her, stop pulling all the cover. And she said, sister, I'm not pulling the cover. 
and I knew she wasn't, because she was perfectly still. Well, next thing we knew, we were rolling downstairs. It scared us. Well, anyway, Louis was there from the time we moved in until the next October he married, and he slept up there one night, and he was the first one that told us the cover slid off him, and we knew very well there wasn't anybody up there. Well, we didn't go back up there to sleep anymore. So that went on. Oh, I don't know, a long time? We didn't go back up there to sleep anymore. Papa tried to get us to, but we told him he could if he wanted to, but we wouldn't. So then that fall, we started to school, and the school building was close, where we walked, and in the evenings, there was a little pond. We had to pass this pond, coming from the school to the house, and I happened to look up at the upstairs window, and until today, I can see that it looked like a big, a huge Newfoundland. What do you call those dogs? Not a Newfoundland, but a St. Bernard. It looked just like a huge St. Bernard dog reared up to that window, and just as plain as if I'd been standing there. Well, Sook saw it too. We both did. I said, look, and she looked, and there was that dog. It looked just like a big St. Bernard dog reared up to that window. Well, it was after that in the evenings when we'd come home and get along by this pond. I don't know why we didn't hear anything or see anything until we'd get near this pond. Then we'd hear an organ start playing. Near my God to thee. Nana, nah, that's absolutely the truth. And if Mildred were here, she'd tell you the same thing. Well, it just excited us so that we didn't know whether something had happened to Mama or what. We were just almost afraid to go to the house. We were all excited and telling Mama about it, and she kind of laughed it off. Then she got to telling us about hearing those voices more than once. She said she'd gone out of the house to look and see who was coming up out front. Well, it went on like that. And then in the winter time, one Sunday night, my boyfriend was there. And he and Mildred and I were sitting in front of the fire. And we knew the spinning wheel was upstairs. But we knew there wasn't anybody up there because Mama and Papa and Jake were in the other room. And it was in the winter. And that spinning wheel started spinning. Oh, it sounded like you'd gone and taken your finger, you know, like you spin a wheel too, and it would stop on a certain number. It just spun and just roared. It ran so fast. Well, this boyfriend of mine, he said, what's that? We told him. It, well, they always said it was Mr. Yancey upstairs. That's what Emma, everybody around said. We weren't the only ones that had ever heard it either. Then Mama had a wire clothesline up there where she hung her clothes in the winter. And that thing, one night, this same fellow was there and it sounded like you had taken your finger and pulled that wire down tight and turned it loose. And it made a funny noise again. And I was telling Jim about this. And he said, do you actually believe in all of that? I said, well, if he was here, he could tell you the same thing, but he can't be here to tell you because he's dead. Oh, and again, it was in the winter time, and Mildred and I had gone to bed, and then, well, she and I all the time slept across that hall from where Mama and Papa slept. We'd gone to bed, and it was just lying there talking, and whenever we closed the door, then went into the hall, and we heard this noise. And you know how a dog, when he has run quite a distance, and when he gets hot, how he will lap his tongue, you know, and make the noise. And that was the kind of sound we heard. It came out of the hall, and you could hear it. It sounded like you could hear his claws hooking in the carpet as it went across. It went to the big fireplace and just disappeared. And we jerked the covers over our heads, and I don't know how long we kept the cover over our heads. We were so scared. But finally, when I got nerve enough, I eased the cover back. And I called for Papa, and he told me what we'd heard, and I said, Light the lamp 
and bring it in here. Well, he or Mama, one lighted the lamp, but they didn't come across that hall. We rolled out of that bed and went across the hall and we didn't go back in there that night either. And that's the only time we ever heard that. But we kidded Mama and Papa about being afraid. They were scared too. And I don't know whether they had heard noises in the house either, but we lived there three years and we heard things once in a great while. But he always said it was the rats running across the floor upstairs. Granddaddy's house. When my granddaddy bought that place down here, why, they moved over from the other side of the mountain. And so they had a lot of stuff to move. They brought over a load or two of stuff, two wagonfuls, and brought some of the women over, and they stayed all night. While the men folk went back across the mountain to get some more furniture and stuff. Well, there was three women, I think, they were kind of brave, so they brought lard and all kind of groceries and stuff, you know, to have, and that's what they brought with the first load. So they had a great big dog they brought along with them for these women to keep with them if anything bothered them. They said they had a big jar, a big stone jar, and they put lard in it, and they put it in the big press in the back of the room. They put this lard and some meat and stuff in there. Well, the women stayed there that night, and the men folk went on back over the mountain to get another load. So they said way in the night when they heard something fall in the dining room, about near the old closet. It was that press where they'd put the lard and the other stuff in. One of the women said to the other one, Lord have mercy, let's get up and go in there, the other one said. That dog, I bet done knocked that big jar of lard over. And they got up and lit the lamp and went in there. And the door was fastened to the press. And their lard was back in that part of the hall where they used to keep the saddle under the stair steps. And I heard my granddaddy, after he lived down there, said they could hear him go out there every night and hear something dragging, you know, taking the saddle out and hearing the belly cinch and the buckle part being dragged across the floor when they wanted not out the door and down the steps. Somebody had the saddle in their arm and the buckle on the belly banging over, dragging on the floor. They said they heard that and they went in there to see if it was somebody that had gotten the saddle or was trying to leave. Some of the boys, they always be out riding, trying to catch a horse after night. Then the saddle was back in there just like they had left it before. The Carter's Old House. In 1826, Mary Carter was married and moved there to the house in Huntsville, Alabama. In 1836, Sally, who was Mary's sister, came to visit. There she caught the whooping cough and died. She is buried in the family cemetery. Before my grandmother moved there, two other families owned it and in between the house was unoccupied for long periods of time. They moved there in 1919, and the woman who was moving out told them to not let Sally's tombstone get toppled over. So one time, my grandparents were having a party, and they invited a whole bunch of people, and they had to stay overnight. So my cousin, Charles Martin, had to sleep in the upstairs hall. During the night, a storm came up, and he looked out, over the balcony and saw a ghost standing there. She had long blonde hair and she had on a long white robe and she walked very softly through the screen door and sat down on the inside. She put her hand on his forehead and said, will you please help me? A tree has knocked my tombstone over. So the next day Charles got up and told everybody what happened and he finally got my grandfather and some men to go over to the cemetery and the tombstone was toppled over. So they put it back up. They thought Charles had dreamed it all up. They didn't think it was any big deal. After that, my daddy and my aunt grew up in that room. And after they left, this man moved in. He rented the house from my grandmother. He was a very heavy chain smoker and Sally didn't like it. You know she didn't like smoke. 
because every time somebody was smoking, she would slam doors and things like that. I've heard that on her grave the headstone fell over, and every time they put it up, it falls back over. It won't stand up for anything. If you stand on her grave at night, she will haunt you that night. She will follow you home. This friend of mine heard that she was in love with this guy, and he didn't love her back. So she jumped off that balcony into a rose bush. You hear all kinds of stories, and they just get bigger and bigger. That really didn't happen, or did it? The Haunted House in San Elizario. There is this house in San Elizario that's haunted, but he's a funny ghost that haunts it. He only likes women. If a girl goes into the house, he pinches her. The house belongs to some people named Lujan. I think they were related to me. Anyway, they all died. Some people moved into the house. The ghost kept bothering the wife, pinching her. They didn't like it, so they moved out. Some more people moved in. The ghost pinched this wife, too. When they went to bed, she could feel the ghost feeling her and rubbing his hands on her legs. But they got used to the ghost. Why don't you go see for yourself? If you dare. Mrs. Graves' Farmhouse One evening at a little farm out west of Warren, Sam Graves sat down at his kitchen table to have supper. For reasons unknown, he and his wife had been having trouble. Before Sam had a chance to help his plate, his wife, who had prepared the nice supper, walked out behind him with a rifle and shot him point blank in the upper part of his back. Stunned, Sam slumped over the table, filling the plate before him with blood. Then he rose to his feet, staggered across the room out the front door, and sat down on the front porch steps. His wife dropped the single-shot rifle and grabbed up the butcher knife from the table. She ran out to where her bleeding and stunned husband sat and started stabbing him repeatedly with a knife. Once again, Sam got up and half stumbled, half crawled out to the orchard and died. This happened in 1922. Mrs. Graves had been apprehended and executed. The little farmhouse stood untouched for many years. Everything was left just as it was the evening of the murder. Even the dried up blood stains were still in the plate on the table. But years later, a member of a logging crew swore he heard a shot come from the house as he was walking by the vicinity. He was alone, but he went in the house to investigate. He was horrified when he saw the plate on the kitchen table filled with fresh blood. At first, people back in Warren thought he was crazy. The logger took some men back out to the haunted farm, but all they found was a plate of dried blood looking like it had for years. But people changed their minds when they realized it had been exactly 10 years to the day since Sam Graves had been murdered. Still today, many people who remember the incident believe that Sam Graves gets murdered again and again on that horrible anniversary. My ghost story. This is a personal account of a ghost story that occurred a little more than 40 years ago. And at that time, the house which I visited had been empty some three or four years. I was staying at the Edgewater Beach Hotel on the Gulf Coast with my Aunt Harriet, who was a professional journalist. She was editor of a paper at that time. Until 1959, she held that position. She was a woman of truth and integrity, and she didn't hold much with ghosts. But we made this excursion at the specific request of a friend of hers whose house this was. The friend had been long-term friends of hers, and they owned a large plantation-type home on the Gulf. But they had not been able to live in it for several years because their daughter, who had been a teenager, had committed suicide in the house, and her ghost was reported to haunt the house. At any rate, late one evening after dinner, and moving well past my bedtime, we got into the car and drove down towards the beach with Aunt Harriet. Instructions were that we were going to examine something that she considered to be a phenomenon, and that although she didn't believe in ghosts, there were some unusual occurrences taking place in this house. 
and we were just going to see what was there. And then she was going to report back to the parents and tell them that obviously there was no such thing as a ghost there and that it was all right. But we were supposed to be able to explain what was occurring in the house. So we drove up to the house and entered it with a key and Harriet had gotten from her friends and we arranged chairs in the front hallway and we sat there quietly for some time. It must have been more than an hour and I suppose the appropriate witching hour, which should have been midnight, had gotten close. But I really didn't have much concept of time because I was a child and because one doesn't have much concept of time when one is just sitting in an empty house waiting on something to happen. But along about what I supposed to be midnight, we heard a noise in the upstairs hall and it sounded distinctly like footsteps. And the footsteps came out of a bedroom and closed the door and then proceeded to come down the hall. And my eyes went to the top of the stairs. And although the light inside the house was very dim, I expected to be able to see a figure standing at the top of the stairs. Of course I did not. The steps hesitated for a moment and then continued to come down the stairs slowly but steadily. And as the steps got toward the foot of the steps, which were directly in front of me, I could see even in the dim light a depression in the carpet, and then the steps touched the marble hallway and clicked across the foyer and then went back down the hall just a little way toward the double music room doors, and those doors opened. Naturally, I was terrified, but I looked to Aunt Harriet to see what she was doing, and she was sitting perfectly still, and I knew that I should sit perfectly still too. So we watched the doors open and heard the steps continue across the floor until they came to the piano, which was within our vision with those double doors open. We watched as the piano stool came back. The top to the piano was raised, the keyboard, and then, after a few moments, assuming that this person, whoever it was, was arranging themselves at the stool and in front of the keyboard began to play and continue to play through about three pieces of Chopin, and then the music stopped. The keyboard was lowered. The piano bench went back, and we heard the steps come back out of the room. The double doors were closed and then tap. The steps tapped again across the marble foyer and touched the bottom of the steps, where they hesitated, as though whoever it was that was performing for us was watching us or looking at us because they turned, poised for a moment and then went up the steps, back up the hallway upstairs, went back into the bedroom and the door was closed. That was the end of what was, for me at least, a singular event. And Aunt Harriet said, it's now time to go. So we closed the house up and left, got back into the car and on the way back into town, I asked her if this was indeed the ghost and if this was the girl who was supposed to have killed herself and was now haunting the house and if this was why the parents couldn't stay there anymore. And she told me with one line, and that was the last one on the subject. There is no such thing as a ghost. The Haunted House Near the Cave the next story is about a haunted house that was near a cave in this vicinity. The old house had been there ever since before the Civil War, and people lived in it all of this time. And there was a place way back in the mountains, still of course. The place is still there. There is no house or anything. It was called the Old Russian Place. They're supposed to have a lot of money buried up there, and the man that buried the money had killed a man and took his wife. All the men nearby were gone to war. This was during the Civil War. So he did all of this and he kept the money and everybody wondered where it was. And everybody tried to find it and nobody could. But they moved to this house, down closer to other people. This old Limbarger house, I call it. And they just kind of took over where they lived. Nobody bothered them much because he was kind of a bad man. And the man that got killed had a son, and he had been off in the war. He came back, and all of this had happened. Of course, 
he didn't like that and he decided he'd just get even with this guy so he just sent him word that he was going to kill him well the old man didn't believe him but early one morning someone knocked on the door the woman went to see who it was and it was before the man got up they had a big old room they had this bed in the room and there was a big fireplace a big rock hearth the fireplace was rock and a big mantle this man this young man came in she screamed and he came on in the old man was in the bed just lying there and he saw who it was and he said get out of bed I'm going to kill you he had his gun in his hand the man that was in the bed had his gun under his pillow he went for the gun the man shot at him missed and the bullet went into the mantle under the rock and it went into this piece of wood and the man that was in the bed raised up grabbed his gun but before he could do all of that the guy shot again shot him right in the forehead he fell back dead well of course there was never anything done about that either that I ever heard of and I don't think there was anyone who ever said there was but they took him and buried him and they never did bother to take the bullet out of this mantle now I have seen that place many times and this bullet stayed there just for people to show off until the house burnt several years later but after that the house got haunted now strange things happen there so they say sometimes someone would knock on the door and it would open you'd go see who it was there wasn't a soul there but it would sound like they would step right in the room people thought it was the ghost of this man who came in to kill the man who was in the bed then sometimes the back door would open and they'd have to go close the door they told all kinds of things you could hear a man walking sometimes across the room just like the man that opened the door maybe he'd come back and he'd walk across the room out the front door but you wouldn't see a thing this went on for many years but finally the house burned after that nobody ever saw the ghost this house was located right close to a cave whether that had anything to do with it I do not know the ghostly party I used to play tennis in a park in an older section of El Dorado there was a house across the street owned by H.L. Hunt the house and grounds took up an entire city block by the time I was playing tennis in the park in the 60s no one lived in the house there were signs around the house saying keep out but it was always fun to go sneaking around somewhere you weren't supposed to be I think any old house left empty for a number of years assumes a story or legend someone will go in and hear noises and some kind of a legend will grow out of it this is the way legends are made I don't think the legend things you hear are true there might be some small things of truth in it but it's blown away out of proportion anyway the story about this house was something like a party going on at the house Hunt's girlfriend was there and she fell down the stairs and broke her neck when you go in the house you hear these stories and people think it's Hunt's girlfriend coming back looking for him the house was torn down several years ago so I guess no one will ever know if it was indeed Hunt's girlfriend haunting the place another story my mom and dad used to live in Paragould mother says it was real weird the house had a creepy upstairs that they never used the stairway came down in the dining room mom had a dark green curtain hanging at the end every night when they would go to bed they heard someone walking up and down the stairs for about 20 minutes daddy looked a couple of times and didn't find anything later they heard the lady that lived there before them used to walk those stairs for exercise every night before bed people said that she had left a lot of cats behind and the cats were looking for the woman my mom got so scared after that that she used to follow daddy to the field it went on for about 45 minutes one night daddy was determined to do something he got a flashlight and a gun and went up the stairs when he pulled back the curtain 
something jumped out on him. They looked all through the house and didn't find a thing. Later cats started showing up all over town. No one knew where they were coming from. Then Mama saw a cat eating on the table. She swears it was a strange cat. Sometime later they found out the lady had died in Little Rock. The cats were searching for her spirit. My mother really believes that. The last story. My parents lived in a haunted house right after they were married. A man froze to death in the house about four or five months before they moved there. They said when it started turning cold that people began to talk. Well, the first night it snowed, they got in a disagreement about hogging the cover. Every morning at breakfast, they would accuse each other of taking all the cover during the night. One night before they went to sleep, the cover began to move. Mom said something to Dad. He said, me? The cover was being pulled off at the foot of the bed. The next day, they started looking for a house. It took them a while to find another place. That was the only thing they noticed. They talked to the thin air at night. They said they would talk and the cover would move different ways. I'm getting married during Christmas. We have rented an older type here in Jonesboro. I'm sort of wary because I don't want to have a ghost in the bedroom just like my parents. <laughs>